Hi, team. Sorry, I'm a little bit late again. Same problem as last time. I just got off the got off Mount Ashland and raced home as fast as I could. And I almost made it. So I will spare you looking at my hair and leave this hat on for today. So we are going to look at something kind of cool today, um, vectors. And um, it's a great application for everything that you already know, fortunately. So this shouldn't feel brand new. Um, it should feel like, I don't know if I want to say review, because that makes it sound a little too easy. It's not going to be that easy, but, but it is going to be based on things that you already kind of understand. Um, you might, let's see, let share my other screen. I went in to my open math and I put, where did I put that? Oh, that's right, I made a math 112 file. That's what I did. I put my own um, note sheet in there for you because I noticed the one that you had didn't have some of the stuff that we're talking about tonight. So this sheet that you see before your eyes with that awesome meme. There's a nerdy meme right now that you now can laugh at. Before this class, you would just could not laugh at that, but now you can laugh at that. Um, it has all the same junk on there that you already understand, all the trig identities and so forth. Um, it has what I consider to be a little bit clear of an explanation of law of sines and cosines, just because it has you know angle A across from side A and so forth. And by the way, <clears throat> you'll be able to use this for the test. I hope to find time to teach you about projectile motion because that's really cool. And then this stuff right here. Mainly what we're going to be doing is kind of this tonight. Um, so I, you won't, I'm going to write this down, but I just want to point out that it's in there for you. And maybe we'll have a chance to do some of the cooler stuff with vectors. We'll just see how much time we have. And awesome. So you might pull that up. It's in the, I forgot what it's in, but it's in the course materials or something at the top of my open math for you. I threw it in there this morning. So awesome. So let me share your screen and let's get after it. This is not school stuff. And I think I'll start off, I'm going to start off with kind of a, a problem that you did the other day, actually, but now I'm going to show you how to do it sort of a way easier way. And this is kind of why vectors are cool. So let's consider this. Vectors. So I gave you a problem the other day that was something like this. And let's just maybe do something similar. So the airplane is going in this direction. And I could just tell you that the, I'll just kind of draw the picture, build it as we talk about it. But so let's see, what angle does that look like? Um, we'll say that's an angle of 20 degrees. Let's make it 22 degrees. And let's make it faster, like 450 miles per hour. It's a really fast plane. And then we talked last time, and I'll, I think we'll just do this problem kind of the easier way. Then we kind of add a wind to this, and let's make it kind of a tailwind. And we'll make that, say, I don't know, 40 degrees. And that's since I made the plane so fast, let's make this kind of windy so it actually makes a difference say like 60 miles an hour of wind. That seems kind of high for wind. And so the cool thing about a vector is like this is a vector. A vector is nothing more than basically something that has a direction. That's the angle. And what your book anyway would call a magnitude. In this case, in this problem, that magnitude is miles per hour. But I'll show you some other problems in a minute. They're kind of neat in that regard too. 
Um, ah, just for the fun of it, let's make this negative 40. So the cool thing about vectors, and, 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 and that first one is a vector because it has a direction and, and uh, some kind of a, a strength, a magnitude in this case, 450 miles per hour. So let's see, if I went negative 40, that might be down there. And so I end up with this. So that angle is 40 degrees since it's negative 40 and the original one is 20 and so awesome. And so what we're after ultimately, or what, you know, in this, in this particular case, what we're after is kind of this resultant or the result of this. And so what's kind of cool about vectors is no matter where they are, you can actually move them head to tail. And so we talked last time about how, you know, the plane is actually going to fly in that direction. And you even have a question in your assignment tonight about this, where they say, you know, how many degrees is that going to blow you off course? And so we worked maybe a little bit too hard, if you will, last time at this. And I want to show you, if you will, kind of an easier way to think about this based on the concept of a vector. And so what it comes down to is changing everything into X's and Y's, changing everything into X and Y components. And so what we did last time is we said, hey, look, there's a non-right triangle. I can use law of sines and law of cosines on that, which is great, that works awesome. And I actually would encourage you to see if you could get this problem right with law of sines and law of cosines. Um, let me see, let me think for just one second here. What would this angle be? It's hard to kind of figure out what angle Let's see if I extended that, that would be 20 and that would be 40. So what angle do I know? How can I figure an angle out in this? Uh, let's see, is this helpful? If I went up here, I'm probably gonna erase this. If that was 20, this would be 70 and that'd be 90. That means this angle would be 20. Ah, there we go. There it is, I don't need this one. I have 20 and 40, which is 60. And so does it make sense this angle right here would be 120 degrees? And now you know 450, now you know 450, you know 120 degrees. Actually, I'm sorry, that was 22. I said 22 and wrote 20, so I'm going to fix it and make it 22. Got to concentrate, so this is 68, this is 22, so that's 62, so that makes that 118 degrees. So you have 450 for the length or the magnitude of that vector. You have 60 for the magnitude of this vector. And so do you see that you have side angle side? And so you could use the law of sines to figure out, to figure out R. And you could even find the angles, but let's use vectors to do this. Vectors, how does that work? So the cool thing about vectors is, is you basically break everything into X, Y components all the time. In other words, when I told you that the airplane was 450 for its magnitude and it was 22 degrees for its angle, does it make sense you sort of have the airplane in Y and the airplane in X and you could just use regular sine, cosine, and tangent for that. So you can actually break the speed into its X and Y components. And so again, you should feel reasonably good about this. For instance, if I say P of Y, wouldn't that be equal to sine? So I'll at least write this out for you. In other words, the sine of 22 is opposite over hypotenuse. So that means P of Y would be 450 times the sine of 22. So let's see, am I in radiant degree mode? Yes, I am. And so that's a formula on that formula sheet. In other words, if you take the magnitude of the vector 450 and you multiply it by the sine of the angle, then that'll give you the Y component. So 450 times the sine of 22, I get 168, I'm gonna round it off. P of Y is approximately 168.6 miles per hour. And 
airplane in X would be the same thing, except it'd be 450 times the cosine of 22. And you get a much larger value there. So you get P of X is approximately 417.2. I'm hoping that you're not surprised by that. In other words, that angle, that angle 22 is so small that the X component of, of that 450 is going to be pretty big. It's going to be pretty close to the same, definitely smaller, but pretty close to the same thing. And would you agree that if I wanted to, and this is one of the formulas we'll need for something else later, but doesn't the Pythagorean theorem, like if I wanted to check my work, couldn't I check to see if 417.2 squared plus 168.6 squared is approximately 450 squared. It's not gonna be perfect because I rounded our two answers off. And so what you'll see in the book when you look at this is the airplane, and then they're going to give you, this is kind of a cool way to do it. This is, this is kind of neat. It's not something you've ever seen before, but you'll sort of write it like an XY component. And that's really what it is, except for it has little brackets on it instead of, instead of, you know, kind of parentheses. But the reason is, is because vectors can be anywhere. I'll show you some simpler examples in just a minute. But all this is really saying is wherever you want to start from, it isn't saying go to the point x is 417.2, y is 168.6, because you're not starting from zero. You can start from anywhere. Like there's no x, y axis in this problem. That's just saying that's the x component and that's the y component. And so similarly, what about the wind? What about the wind? Well, real quick, I can find this really fast. So if I said I want to know the wind in X, then the wind in X is the speed times the cosine of the angle. And I can just stick negative 40 in there and it'll, it'll give me that. 60 times negative times the cosine of negative 40 and I got... So how do you know that wind of x is 60 cosine of negative 40? Because if I, it's always going to be cosine because it's x. And if I draw that right triangle just for the wind, since the wind was negative 40, so there it is, and that's 60 miles an hour, then that creates a right triangle. This is my negative 40. And so this is the wind in x and this is the wind in y. And so the cosine of that angle would be adjacent over hypotenuse. Cosine of negative 40 is adjacent over hypotenuse. And so that's what leads to this. So it's just Sokotoa. But I would encourage you, like, draw the right triangle and use Sokotoa to figure this out. But that note sheet that I showed you just a minute ago, and I'll write that down formally for you in just a second. It, it, it lists that. I'm gonna check real quick to see if I actually pulled this in. So this note sheet you will get, we are using that right there. So you can use this note sheet, but, but do you see that that's just Sokotoa? So the X coordinate will always be the, the R, the hypotenuse, the radius times the cosine of theta, just like we, we sort of memorized earlier that cosine was always the X coordinate. That's the reason cosine is always the X coordinate. Um, and you had to multiply by the radius if the radius wasn't one. If the radius is one, like for a unit circle, then you don't even have to have R there because it's just cosine of theta is X. So we're just making use of those formulas.
So for that reason, the wind in the y direction would be 60 times the sine of negative 40. The sine of negative 40. And 60 times the sine of negative 40 is negative 38.6. But again, do you see that that's working? In other words, if you go over 46 and then you go down 38.6, doesn't that actually establish exactly what we just described? Like, hey, that's a 40 degree angle. And if we did the Pythagorean theorem on those, sure enough, we'd get 60 for that. So there's just two ways of describing things. In the end, this is what mathematicians call polar coordinates versus rectangular coordinates. In other words, if you say, hey, I would like to fly wind, from this starting point to this point over here, there's two ways you can get there. You can rectangularly go right 46 and down 38.6, and that would describe your location. That's how you get there. But you can also say, let's turn 40 degrees clockwise, negative 40, and then let's travel 60, and that'll also get us there. Does that make sense? And so I could say, awesome, the wind is 46 is my x coordinate and negative 38.6 is my y coordinate. Now, how are you tracking with that? Are you like, yeah, I got it. Um, I don't really understand why we would write it kind of like coordinates rather than just writing the angle that the wind is going at. Yeah, in other words, what good is all this? Like, why would I do all of this? Well, now I'm about to show you. So if you want to know what I was calling back here R, and I picked R because that's really kind of the result. What's the result? What's actually gonna happen to the plane if they're trying to fly at 22, but the wind says, no, I'm gonna blow against you at 40. What will this actually be? Well, cool enough. All you have to do is add those two together. This is really cool. So to get the result then, to get the X, all you have to do is add the X's for 17.2 plus 46. There's your X coordinate. So I don't have to do the law of sines, law of cosines. To get the Y coordinate, I go 168.6 and I add, or in this case, subtract 38.6. So I'm doing that quickly on my calculator, 417.2 plus 46. I got 463.2 and 160, I can do that in my head, 168.6 minus 38.6 is 130. Do you understand what that says? Do you understand what that's saying? Again, I, I got this right without law of sines and cosines. That's kind of cool. I assume that the result is saying that the plane is going to be blown off course by that amount. That's actually saying that's how the plane's actually going to fly. Like it's trying to fly at 20 deg two degrees, but this is what it's actually telling us. So the plane, although it started here and started flying, it's actually going to kind of go, if you will, right 463.2 and up 130. So we now know the result. Like that's the same as that picture I drew earlier. Let's go up there and draw it. So the scale is not the same, but it's basically saying the plane is actually going to fly. There's R, the green R. This is the 463.2. And the other one was the 130. So I'm getting this without the law of sines and the law of cosines. Now that you have those two things, does it make sense you could find this angle right here if you wanted to? What would you do to find that angle? Somebody tell us, is that a sine, cosine, or a tangent problem? Tangent. 
tangent? Yeah, opposite over adjacent. So the tangent of theta is equal to 130 over 463.2. So if I go inverse tangent of that, I'm hoping you feel good about this. We have the final coming. Inverse tangent of 130 divided by 463.2. I get that theta is approximately 15.7 degrees. In other words, that's the way the plane's actually going to fly. Remember how the, the pilot said, I'm going to fly at 22. Basically, the wind says, no, you're not. You're going to fly at 15.7. That's what you're actually going to do because the wind's actually blowing you. Well, from that original picture, isn't the wind blowing the angle smaller? So since this little sliver right here is 15.7 degrees, does it make sense? You, you know the actual bearing the plane's going to fly? Or the other question, and I think your book asked it this way, is, is how many degrees is it blowing you off course? Well, remember 22 was all the way from level up to there. So the difference between those two, 22 minus 15.7, what is that, 6.3? So 6.3 degrees off course. And I didn't have to use the lab signs. That's kind of cool. The second thing you might want to know is the actual speed. Would you agree from this picture that the wind is a little bit behind the airplane? And so the wind is going to speed the airplane up. It's actually going to fly a little bit faster. It's blowing it off course, but the wind's behind it. It's a bit of a tailwind. So what's the actual speed? Not the intended speed, 450, but the actual speed. And there's a symbol for this that you've never seen before. That's magnitude. That's the symbol for magnitude. Magnitude just means the amount. In this case, you'd say speed. It's just magnitude is the generic word for any situation. I'll show you other examples in a minute. That's the magnitude. And so you say, well, that's not hard. That's Pythagorean theorem. I already know that. That's 463.2 two squared plus 130 squared, that's terrible, square rooted. Square root of 463.2 squared plus 130 squared, bam, 481.1. In this case, miles per hour. So notice, you know your actual bearing you now know the plane's actually going to fly at 15.7 because of the wind, and you know it's actual speed. That's pretty cool. So if you understand Pythagorean theorem and SOHCAHTOA, then you don't, you're not learning anything new here. You're just learning an application for it. But isn't that what these two statements are referring to? Like, isn't that we just did it a second ago? We just did inverse tangent of y over x. That's how we found theta. And we took x and squared it and y and squared it and added it together and square rooted it. Like, it's nice to have this note sheet in front of you just so that you kind of, you know, don't do something dumb, but you should, you should think, I already know that. Did we already check our answer in the second and third quadrant? In our case, we sort of got lucky, and we'll talk about that. But remember, inverse tangent is only going to give you answers in the first and the, let's see. It's going to give you answers in the first and the fourth quadrant from your calculator. And sometimes it won't be there. So you have to think about that. Remember, when you go inverse tangent, there's two answers to it. And so this is a hint to you that you kind of already know that if you're if the resultant put you in the second or the third quadrant then the calculator is not going to produce that in our case we got lucky because our finished vector was in the first quadrant so when we said inverse tangent the answer actually made sense so we'll we'll deal with that i'm sure when it comes up here randomly
Um, we may we may come back to this question in a second, but I'm, I just want to make sure we kind of get through. Make sure we have time to kind of play with all the stuff that's a little more straightforward, but I'll show you a place that I use this when I teach engineering. I'm teaching statics right now, which is which is based on this exact thing. And and so here's something that happens in on a bridge or on a truss. Let's say I've got a truss and it's got three forces pulling on it. Those two, and that one's way bigger. What in the world? That one's way bigger. Now, just to keep this simple for you, I'm gonna kind of write them this way. I'm gonna say this one is theta equals, again, I'm just imagining that line and measuring up to it, because you know that these are measured from what we call zero. So that might be, say, 38 degrees. And let's say that's 80 pounds of force that the that member of the bridge is pulling. And then this one over here, let's say that that's probably closer to 90. So maybe that's like 72 degrees. And that's a little shorter. So we'll say that's 76 pounds. And then this one over here, can you name that? Like you should be able to make an estimate for this. I'll just give you a second to think about that. But remember, you're measuring from here all the way around to there. So, you know, what kind of a number am I going to give that? You should have a sense of what kind of a number that would be. It's almost made it to 180, right? So an angle like 170 degrees would be reasonable there. And notice it's way longer. And this is the key to vectors. It's way longer. Therefore, it's going to be bigger. So I don't know, does that look like double the 76? So that's like 150 or somewhere in there. This is like 150 pounds. So my question to you is, what's the result of that? What's the, the engineer's got to figure out what's, what's that joint going to want to do because they have to keep it from moving. I mean, that's the essence of engineering is if you have a joint on a bridge, then it can't move. If it moves, the bridge is falling. So let's not have any stuff be moving. Now, I want to take a second and show you this in AutoCAD just because it's kind of cool. This is how vectors work. Those forces are all pulling and you should feel kind of confused by that. Like, wow, how am I supposed to know which direction that's going to go? You should see things like, well, these are pulling to the right. So they're both trying to get it to go right. Um, but then this one's pulling left. And so what do you think? Who's going to win? Tug of war. Is it going to go right or is it going to go left? What's the result of that? Um, it's certainly going to go up, right? All of them are pulling it up. So it's going to go up pretty darn hard. And then, I don't know, what do you think, left or right? My immediate guess is that it would go left. Maybe left. Notice the, the 150 is pulling a lot more horizontally. Would you agree that this 76 right here is pretty strong, but it's not, not much of that is actually going right. Do you see what I'm saying? So let me let me show you this in AutoCAD or like what vectors in a sense really really are because because of AutoCAD I can actually cheat and answer this question perfectly correct. So I'll share that screen. I can cheat and answer this because of the software program that I have. And this will be drawn accurately. So I'm actually going to type, I'm going to type these exact angles. So right now I'm saying angle 38. Notice it's sticking on 38 degrees and now I can type 80. So there's 80. Then I'm going to do it again. Line from here, this time angle 72 degrees. So I'm typing angle 72. It sticks on 72, and now I can type 76. Ah, oh, why did you go away? I don't know. Angle 72, enter, 76, enter. And lastly, I can say angle 170. I'm sorry, yeah, angle 170. Angle 170. 
and that distance or that weight, that's a weight. So notice last time it last time the vector was miles per hour and this time it's pounds. So those units are always different. That's why somebody came up with the generic word magnitude. It's kind of like stands for everything. So it's meaningless all by itself. And so does it make sense that every one of these kind of has an arrowhead on it? I'll draw kind of a lame looking arrowhead, just ugly and quick. So they're all pulling in this direction. So the cool thing about vectors is that they don't have to stay there. Watch this, this is very important. I'm gonna copy this. This is why vectors are powerful. I can take this vector right here, doesn't even matter which one I pick, and I can move it so that it picks up right where that one left off. So now it's kind of like this vector pulled it to here, and then thirdly, that one pulled it to here, and now this last one, if I move it head to tail, it pulled it to there. Do you agree that this then is the result? That's the result. I'm going to change its color so it stands out to you a little bit more. Let's make it green. That's the result. Now, can you appreciate that if you were to try to do this with law of sines and cosines, you would actually have to temporarily, I'm not going to go into it, but you'd have to do two law of sines and law of cosines problems. You have to make triangles out of this in order to do it. You'd actually have to start with this triangle right here, kind of look at two of them, basically figure that whole triangle out. And then once you had that whole triangle figured out, then you could move up to this whole triangle. Or perhaps you could go over to this triangle. Like you have a whole bunch of triangles you'd have to figure out. And so this technique I'm showing you is really cool. Now, because this is because this is AutoCAD, I can actually cheat and tell you the resultant right now. There's the resultant magnitude, 159.76. If we turned all of those, and I might quickly do this, if we turned all of those into X and Y coordinates, then we can just add them all together. So the cool thing about vectors is we don't have to do two law of, so, so, law of sines and law of cosines problems. We can just write them all as X's and Y's, add all the X's, add all the Y's, boom, we're done. And secondly, what angle are we at? Well, notice in AutoCAD, I can just go in here and say, what angle is this? Notice it says rounded off, it's 113 degrees. So that's the result of this. If they all pull, if all three of these forces pulled on it, that joint is going to want to be pulled at 113 degrees and it's going to have 160 pounds of force on it. That will be the result of all those forces. And so an engineer's got to know that so that they can pull in the other direction and stop it. So I'll show you something else really quick. Does it make sense? That is the right triangle. That's the right triangle that results from this. So when I add all the X's together, I'm going to get that X length right there. How long is that length? So we'll do this using math in just a second. That's 61.1373. So this is the vector that will result from this. It's height, 147.6. So actually, the key to vectors is you can redraw them head to tail, just like we did with the wind. We redrew the wind. The wind would be blowing everywhere. There'd be vectors everywhere with wind blowing. We just took one of them and we moved it over to the kind of the end of the airplane 
force and we said, okay, well then this will be the result over here. We redrew them head to tail. They're not stuck in a particular location. So, I wasn't gonna do this, but I think I will because it's so quick. I'm just trying to, for those of you who you know are gonna go on, I'm trying to help you understand that, that this is a pretty powerful concept. I'm trying to give you some realistic examples that your book won't give you. So let's um, label these. This we'll call this one force one, force two, and force three. And so I'm just gonna write these out really fast. Force one, we said that if you take the radius 80, 80 times the cosine of 38, that that would give you the X coordinate. I got 63.04. I think I'll just call that zero. If I take 80 times the sine, I got 49.3. So there's the X coordinate. There's the X coordinate, 63, and the Y coordinate, 49.3, notice that looks about right. This distance is 80. That angle is 38. That's kind of cool, it was really fast. All I did was break that into its X and Y components. Do the same thing with force two. If I take 76 times the cosine of 72, I get 23.5. If I take 76 times the sine of 72, I get 72.3. Can you see that that looks about right? If I went over horizontally a distance of 23 and then I went up a distance of 72, then the hypotenuse would be 76. That looks about right, doesn't it? Like the math is working. Lastly, force three, would be 150 times the cosine of 170. Notice I get automatically, I didn't even have to think about it, I get a negative number, negative 147.7. Of course I get a negative number because that's going this direction, it's negative. It's, so, the, so the 170 degrees took care of the negative and the cosine took care of it automatically for me. And then if I do 150 times the sine, I get 26.04, 26.0. So what do I do to get the result? I just add them all up. Add the X's with the X's. So if I take 63 plus 23.5 <coughs> plus negative 147.7, I get negative 61.2. Looking over at AutoCAD, was that the size? Is that the size we got a minute ago? Yeah, it was 61.13. So I just got the same answer we got a second ago. Awesome. Add up all the Y's, 49.3 plus 72.3 plus 26. They're all positives. And I got 147.6. Yeah, that's the result. Sometimes in a physics class, I'll just tell you this now, and you may see this in your book someplace, but sometimes people even put like a little arrow over the top of it because they're just telling you, hey, this is a vector. It's, a, it's an arrow. And you're being given this in its X and Y components. This final result here is a vector. And so the little arrow over the top of it. So since this is the X and this is the Y, the formula sheet I just showed you a minute ago said if we take the inverse tangent of X of, of y over x, 147.6 over negative 61.2, that I'll get that angle. I'm going back to AutoCAD really quickly here. What angle did we get for this resultant? It was 113 degrees. I have a bad memory. So when I take this inverse tangent problem, I should get negative, keep all the negatives in it, negative 61.2. Uh-oh, I got theta equals negative 67.5. 
but I didn't get 113. Remember what my note sheet said? You got to be careful if your resultant is where? From our picture a second ago, wasn't our resultant like right there? That's in that, that's in the second quadrant. The calculator didn't give us the second quadrant answer. Remember, tangent cannot distinguish between these two problems. What if the neg what if the 147.6 was negative, but the 61.2 was positive? Does it make sense? Tangent can't tell the difference. It's the inverse tangent of a negative number. So it actually gave us that answer. If I went X is 61 and then Y is negative 147, that puts me down in the fourth quadrant. See, the calculator is only going to give you first and fourth quadrant answers. And so if you ever have a vector that's in a different quadrant, then you got to think about it. Notice you can tell you don't have to draw the picture. Take a look at what we said our answer was. Like, doesn't it have a negative X and a positive Y? Like, I didn't have to draw the picture to know where that was. A negative X and a positive Y is going to put me over there in the in the second quadrant. And so, you know, my note on my note sheet, danger, you got to think about that a little bit. So what you should understand from, again, previous classes is we just got this answer right here, negative 67.5. And the other answer that's equal is 180 degrees off of that. So if I just add 180 to that, plus 180, look at that, 112.5. So theta is actually 112.5. Can you see why AutoCAD gave us 113? Because it rounds off to the nearest degree. If I'd set that to round to the 10th, we would have got around 112.5. So we know the direction, cool. So you'll have problems. The hardest problems on the assignment will say, find the magnitude and the direction of the resulting vector. And we'll look at your homework assignment so you kind of feel good about it. Found the direction. If they ask for the magnitude, remember that's kind of code for this, which just says do Pythagorean theorem on your two numbers. Since I'm squaring them, I don't really care that 61 is negative because I know it's going to turn into positive. Um, if you leave it negative, that's fine, but be careful because if you don't put that negative 61 in parentheses before you square it, it's not going to actually, it's going to get a negative number for that. Do you know that? So if I say the square root of 61.2 squared plus 147.6 squared, I get 159.8. And in this case, that is pounds. And isn't that what we just found a second ago? I kind of cheated and drew them all head to tail. And from the very start, that's the first thing I found. It was 159.76. I don't think you can see that. But if you will, we're looking at a way to figure out the result of a whole bunch of forces. It's really powerful. This is really kind of neat math. So I found the magnitude and the direction. That's awesome. So let's take one second here and just kind of stare at your kind of the way I'll show you some of the easier questions in your homework assignment, just to kind of let you stare at them a little bit. Zoom, bam, my open math, bam. That's 112, rip down to section 8.4. I didn't remember what we were doing tonight. 8.4, look at the assignment. 
15 points. Woo! So I'm skipping down to the bottom. So here's one, airplane heading north. Notice they didn't give you an angle. They actually made this easier. The airplane's heading north. What angle are you going to call north? 90 degrees. 90 degrees, because you're measuring from zero, so north. So it's heading at 90 degrees, 700 kilometers an hour, but there's a wind blowing from the northeast. That's also confusing. I hate this. I hate questions like, I wish I'd just give you an angle. From the northeast, let's see, never eat shredded wheat, northeast, northeast. So it's blowing from the northeast towards you. Does that make sense? That's kind of tricky. So because they said northeast, I guess we're talking 45 degrees right in the middle. Was, but that's kind of dumb. Like, I wish they just told us an angle. If I put a test question on this, I'd do it like I did. I would just give you an angle. Um, but think, you got to think about that question fairly carefully. But notice what it's asking. The plane will end up flying, in this case, how many degrees off course? And then they say the plane's speed relative to the ground. Do you see? Do you understand why they say relative to the ground? Because the plane is still flying, like our plane was flying at 450. But thanks to the wind, a person on the ground would have thought it was flying much faster. Does that concept make sense? So that's all they mean by saying it's from the ground. Like our plane ended up flying. I forgot. 481 miles an hour. So that's its actual speed. So I've actually already shown you how to get the hardest questions on here right. Ferry shuttles people from one side of the river to the other. In still water, the ferry speed is 15 miles an hour, just like the plane's normal speed was 450. But the river flows directly south at eight miles an hour. But if the ferry is heading west, well, now it's got a current and its speed. And so, you know, where is that going? And again, they're not giving you angles. They're saying, they're saying it's heading directly west. The ferry is trying to head west, but the river's pulling it south. And so you got to kind of do the never eat shredded wheat thing. So I think the problems I just gave you are better. Let's stare at this one for a second. You should recognize this one. And notice they did everything I just described. Three different forces act on an object. Force one, does this mean something to you now? Four, negative one. Okay, can you draw that? That's just the ordered pair from, from zero, zero, over four, down one. Oh, draw an arrow. There we go. So what's cool about this, though, is notice they're already in the right form. They're already in the xy form. And so does it make sense? And they call it not the result, but net, the net force. What do I do to these vectors? Well, notice they say sum the forces. Well, they're already broken to x's and y's. And so all I have to do is add the x's together and add the y's together. And then I have the force net. Now, what I'm not clear about as I read this is what do they mean by the force net? Do they mean write it as a vector? Do they mean write it like this and just add them and I'm done? Or are they actually saying I have to do Pythagorean theorem on those? Does that make sense? I actually am not sure. Let's, let's cheat. You can always try it both ways. <laughs> yeah. Notice I just clicked on it. They're just adding them and they're saying you can quit. Right there. You don't have to actually turn it into the force. You just get to write it as a vector. Awesome. Good. All the better. Now, here's what engineers do. This is really cool. Find the fourth force that would be needed so the net result is zero. Like, that's what you have to do on a bridge. you have to add a fourth force to it so that they all add up to zero so that that way that joint isn't moving anywhere. That's, that's how bridges are designed, if you will, when there's a lot of forces pulling on them. So you have to come back and say, okay, well, if I took four plus negative eight plus negative four plus what would make that zero? And then if I take negative one plus five plus seven plus what would make that zero? I need the vector to be zero, zero. It doesn't moving anywhere at all. Let's back up and look at the start of all of this.
So we'll go, we'll go back and kind of look at this a little bit. So notice there is a vector. It's got a length and it's got an angle. It's got an arrowhead on the end of it. So we can think of that as like force pulling on something or wind blowing on it or an airplane going in that direction, a current in the river or something like that. And all they say is write the vector shown in component form. Can you, can you just read that right off the graph based on the boxes? Yes. Yeah, isn't that right? One, two, three, and then up one, two, three, four, five. It's right three and up five, it's three, five. It's not the ordered pair three, five. It's the vector symbol three, five. So bam. Let's see, how do I get those brackets? Is that just a less than an equal sign? I actually don't know the answer to this. So let's try it right now and find out. I'm just using the, the, the greater than and less than signs. Yeah, so that's what you're typing for those little V's, if you will. So do you see how they're starting off with something a little bit easier? So they're asking us to add vector U, which is U, which is one, zero, one, and vector V, which is negative two, two, and actually add them graphically. Let's go back and just kind of play with Let's just go kind of play with that. Again, we've already done the hardest problems in this assignment. These two questions I just did are harder than anything that's in your assignment. But let's back up and just kind of make sure you understand. And, and I, I kind of struggle with how to introduce this because I could have, I could have shown you this I don't know, how do I say it? Boring stuff first. I could have shown you that boring stuff first, but then you might not, might not have understood what it can do. And I hope I've at least convinced you that this is kind of a powerful concept and it can do some pretty neat things. So let's just back up and do some really easy stuff. So I've got graph paper up here now. And you try this, you try this ahead of me. And I'll do what the book did. Vector u is given by the point, I don't know, two, negative three. And another vector, vector v is given by the, the coordinates. Let's just make it weird. I don't know, negative five, negative four. Can you draw that? Like even if you don't have graph paper, but if you do have graph paper, you can actually get the answer to this perfectly right. I want to know, can you add those vectors graphically and get the answer? And can you add them mathematically and get the same exact answer? The key is you don't even have to start at zero, zero. You can just start anywhere. You need graph paper, but you can start anywhere. Vectors are movable. So I'm starting here. If I go right two and down three, then there's vector u. Awesome. Adding them means rewrite them head to tail. So now that I started from there for you, then I'm going to take off from here and go x is negative 5, 
one, two, three, four, five. Y is negative four. One, two, three, four. So there's vector V. So what I've been calling the resultant then, would you agree that that's, that's the sum of them? That's what it means to add them together if you draw them head to tail. Notice I can just count it. Like I don't, and that's what I just did in AutoCAD. So let's see, I can see that that's left three. So U plus V is apparently negative three. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down. Apparently that's the answer graphically. Do you agree with that? But as I just showed you, you don't have to do that. That's a lot of trouble. Like you don't, you, you would never really do that. Like that's too much trouble to draw that all out. And notice those numbers came out nice whole numbers and so forth. You would do it. Maybe I should say. Can also be done entirely mathematically or analytically by just adding them. X's with X's, Y with the Y's with Y's. For that reason, it's kind of nice to write them over the top of each other like this, one over the top, so that it's kind of obvious you can add them. 2 and negative 5 is negative 3. Negative 3 and negative 4 is negative 7. Look at that. Same exact answer. That's pretty cool. So if I had shown you that first, although that's a little easier introduction than the hard problems that I gave you, you might have thought, well, that's great, but you know, who cares? And, and honestly, the first time I was shown vectors, I didn't realize what they could do. I didn't realize, I didn't realize how powerful they could be. So, you know, being given a couple vectors like this, you know, we could, in this case, we, we decided that we were going to add them. That's kind of cool. But you could also be asked for the magnitude of one of them. You can't be asked for the magnitude of all of them. You could be asked for the magnitude of the sum of them. That'd be okay too. But I hope you see that as, oh, that's just Pythagorean theorem. So if I take two and square it and I take negative three and square it and add those together, yeah, square root of nine plus four, square root of 13. So if my open math wanted an exact answer, I could just leave that at the square root of 13. I know how long vector u is. It's the square root of 13 long. I can turn that into a decimal around it. I can leave it exactly right. I can use the formula, but if I just draw as we did here, if I just draw two and three, I should be able to say, hey, look, right triangle and recognize the Pythagorean theorem right there and maybe not need a formula at all. Now that we've added them, as I mentioned, we could even be asked for the magnitude of their result, their sum. Now that I know that that's negative 3, 7, I could say, okay, cool, let's square negative 3 and let's square negative 7. And let's square root them. That'd be 9 and 49, which I think is 58. So we could say, yeah, square root of 58. That's how long that, that's how long that blue vector is. Notice it doesn't have a meaning here. This isn't miles per hour, which is practical. This isn't pounds, which is practical. It's just numbers on a graph, practice. It's not hard, yeah. I'm going to 
just stare quickly at some other questions in there and just kind of make sure I think they're clear. Um, second question, what about like four U minus two V as a question. So what you're really wouldn't doing. That, wouldn't that give you two U plus V? Like if you're looking at the triangle that you drew above, the results would be the blue line. Yeah, watch this. I'll show you what it means in slow motion, if you will. We said that u was 2, negative 3, right? So that means if I took off from here and went 2, negative 3, and then I did it again, and then I did it again, and I did it again, would you agree that's what 4 you would look like. I remember what four, four times something means. Remember that shortcut for adding them? Like if I say, hey, what's four times eight mean to a, to a kid who doesn't understand multiplication? You just tell them, hey, that means four eights. It's like four eights added together. It's eight plus eight plus eight plus eight. That's four U's. That's U plus U plus U. Didn't I just write them head to tail? So there's the answer to that. So there's that. But notice subtraction. What? That's weird. How do you subtract to V? from it, like V went, we said V went negative five, negative four, right? So you if I added this, it up. Be negative five, negative four, like that would have been negative four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. Would you agree that's what it would be if it was plus? So what's it going to be if I subtract then? It would be to the right five and up four. Yeah, it's exactly right. Re really, you're just able to multiply it. So watch, watch this in action. In other words, if I say what's, what's four times the vector two negative three, like you're actually OK to just multiply the first one times four. It's kind of like distributive law. First one gets multiplied by four, second one gets multiplied by four. Notice that's what happened over here. In other words, I went right one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I went down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So do you see that it's okay to do that? It's okay to full multiply four by both of them. So what we're doing is we're saying times negative two. And so if you say times negative two, negative two times negative five, negative four, then I guess that would turn into positive 10 and positive eight. And so your instinct, Madeline, was exactly right. It's kind of like the reverse. Don't go left five and down four, go right five, one, two, three, four, five, and up four. Notice it's in exactly the opposite direction. And I see now that I've done this poorly and I'm going to run out of room. But I can fix this. And this is a good thing for you to see because vectors can move. And so if I slide this whole assembly to the right, bam, lands right there, boom. Except for I didn't get it to stay in the spot where I thought I dropped it. Try it one more time before I give up. Yeah, got it. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. So it's about right there. Bam. So it's not this. Because we're subtracting. So there's my final answer.
That's what for you. That's the result of subtracting those two. Notice I can just count it. Actually, let's check it first. So I multiplied by negative two. So if I add these together, eight and 10, this is now 18. And negative 12 and eight is negative four. So there's four u minus two v mathematically. Well, did that work out over here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, bam. Down four, one, two, three, yeah, right on. So mathematically, this is really, it's kind of dumb. Like it's really easy. You're just multiplying. It's kind of like distributive law. You're multiplying four times all the U components and you're, because you're making it four times longer. That's what you're really doing. You're making them, the magnitude is four times as big as it used to be. It's four of those put together. So mathematically, this is really simple. It's like multiplication and addition and so forth. Um, but it's kind of profound in what it actually accomplishes. So if, if you know, if you're looking at, engineering and you say, man, I need to double the force that's, that beam's gonna have to hold twice as much weight. Well, all you have to do is multiply by two and now, now the vector is double as long as it used to be. And so this has a practical component to it. We won't go down that road, but. So you can multiply vectors, you can add them together. Kind of cool. Let's see, what other weird things do I see in this assignment we should talk about? There's really kind of two ways to list things, rectangular and polar. So if I gave you a vector and it was, let's see, let's make this easy on you. Let's say this is like five negative two. Can you convert this to polar, which really just means, so I'll say this is vector u, which really just means what angle is that and what is its actual length? I want to give you time to completely get that right or wrong. Draw a picture of five negative two if you want to and observe the right triangle and do this based on Sokotoa and Pythagorean theorem and your logic and so forth or look at that note sheet. You're being given an X and a Y here. So what do you do with those? If you do use formulas, draw, draw the right triangle and 
afterwards and kind of see if you can verify, see if you can kind of check your own answer and see, yeah, that looks about right. That's what it would be. So this time I'm just gonna take the formula approach. See how you did. Formula sheet says if you take the inverse tangent of the Y value over the X value that you'll get the answer. When I did that, I got negative 21.8 degrees. Formula for magnitude says if I just take one number and square it and I add it to the other number squared and then I square root it, that I will get the magnitude. I could either write the square root of 29 or I think I'll write the approximation for it, which is about 5.4. So I just punched calculator buttons. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I just did what the note sheet said and I wrote the answers down. And again, what I think happens a lot in a class like this is the teacher sees that and they're like, good job, you get it, high five. But you know, like, do you understand what you just did? If, if you can't if you can't apply this or use it for something, it isn't a whole lot of good. So let's kind of now, so, so I use the formula. So therefore I'm just going to kind of, kind of check to see if this makes any sense. Well, if I went right five and down two, then we're talking about that for our vector. That's the vector U right there. That's what it actually looks like. And so since this distance is five and this distance is two, does that angle of negative 21 degrees, negative 22 degrees look right? Yeah, it actually does, doesn't it? Looks about right, cool. Notice I got it right. That ended up in the fourth quadrant. So remember inverse tangent's dangerous. I got lucky. I didn't check my work. You just got lucky because it happened to be in the fourth quadrant. You have to check it if it's in the second or the third because it won't give you the right answer, but we were in the fourth. And so great, calculator gave us the right answer. Cool, so the angle looks about right. And then the length, the length is 5.4. Well, yeah, that looks about right too because if this distance was five and this was two, I'd expect this to be a little longer than five, but not way longer. So 5.4 looks about right, so okay, yeah, cool. Can you see that had you drawn this picture first, if you didn't have the note sheet, you should be able to look at that and think Sokoto and Pythagorean theorem and just make, the, make it up without any formulas? All good. Can you go the other way? What if I gave you an angle of two hundred and fourteen degrees and the magnitude of vector V is, I don't know, 18. Could you not go this direction, but could you go from polar, polar form? So this is what mathematicians call these rectangulars. When you get there by, by driving in rectangles, you go right five and down two. And so awesome. But polar is where you turn 214 degrees. This is what you do when you fly or sail a ship, you turn 214 degrees and then you start going 18 miles. That's polar coordinates. So they all have their place, but can you go the other direction? Can you write that in its rectangular form? Again, using, draw a picture of it and just use Sokotoa and Pythagorean theorem or whatever you can come up with. 
um, or use the formula sheet. So if you use the formula, formula is just X is R cosine of theta. Cool. So you mean I just go 18 times the cosine of 214? Yeah, that's exactly right. The 214 will take care of whether it's positive or negative automatically. I got negative 14.9. And the sine is R times the, I'm sorry, the Y is R times the sine of theta, which for us would be 18 times the sine of 214, 18 times the sine of 214. I got 10.1 negative. They're both negative. That's interesting. Notice I never had to take the inverse sine. I took the sine. So it's not, I didn't get this wrong. I knew the angle this time. So this is right. What quadrant? What quadrant would that put you in if the X and the Y were negative? X quadrant? quadrant. Yeah, it's it's negative negative. It put us down here. Isn't 214 down there? Doesn't that seem good? Because this is 180 and that's 270. So wouldn't that be right? Like in a sense, I could have known beforehand, hey, this is going to have a negative X and a negative Y. And I didn't think about it. I just punched the numbers in. But again, I'm just checking my work. I'm thinking, does this make sense to me? So you understand, I hope, the other thing you could have done for this to get it right logically is to say, well, to get to 214, I would turn 180 to there. And then let's see how much past that. I guess that's 34 degrees past it. So 34 more degrees at a distance of 18. So if I called this Y and this X, couldn't you just use Sokoto to figure that out? So it's like, you don't really need those formulas, draw pictures, but you can have those formulas for, for the test. Kind of cool stuff.
So do me a favor, go into the chat and give me a percentage. Like, where are you with this? I'm 90%. I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm not totally awesome yet, but I'm 90%. I'm 40%. I'm terrible. Like, give me a, give me a sense of where we are. I'm having a hard time using the formulas because my brain just automatically wants to go about it the long way and use like law of sines and law of cosines. Got it, got it. Yeah, this is a very different way of looking at it. Lots of you are weighing in in the 60s somewhere. I wanna hear from everybody. Nicholas, did you figure out why your answer was yeah, right, but not quite right? I didn't notice you typed that in there until it was, too, until it was past. Because you had it right, you done backwards. Thanks, that helps me. Sorry, sorry, my mic did not want to unmute. No good deal. I, I think I figured out what I did wrong. I just put, I just plugged it in backwards. Yeah, yeah, and that's super easy to do. So have any of you ever played tennis before? You tried to serve. <laughs> when I was a kid, we were like, let's play tennis. <laughs> and so we'd stand up there at the line and like serve as hard as we could. And it would like hit the ground in front of us or it would like fly into the back fence. Like it is really hard to get a tennis serve to go in. Um, but as a, as a physics example, let's just practice the same concept a little bit more based on the percentages that you're that you're all giving me. So tennis kind of works like this, like there's a, a net in the middle and there's a whole bunch of court over here and a whole bunch of court over here. So the person is gonna be over here with their hand in the air. Oh boy, you're gonna see how crappy I am at drawing now. So they're serving the ball. Does it make sense they're gonna serve it downward? If you've never played tennis before, they're gonna serve it downward. And because it's downward, it might have an angle of, well, let's say negative 12 degrees. They're hitting it down. And a really, the, the fastest serve on record is, I don't know, 140 something, I wanna say, like I'll say 142 miles per hour. So that's the serve. So what I want to know is, can you break that into its horizontal and vertical components? And I'll, I'll tell you something kind of cool about that. There's a, there's a, this is a neat application. So can you break that into its horizontal and vertical components? So I'll draw an arrow on here and say that's vector S for serve. <coughs> so my advice to you is draw this thing out. Draw the right triangle that this represents. All vectors are just right triangles every time. Where's the 12 go? Ultimately, what I want to know is vector S. What is it?
Australian Open major just got over and my, my favorite player, Novak Djokovic, won it. I think I have it. I think I'm pretty sure I put it in right this time. Nice. Throw your answer in chat. Throw your answer in the chat. Everybody do it. Don't worry about the little equal signs or the little greater than signs. Maybe those are easy to find. I don't know. Think about your answer a little bit more, Nicholas, because if you did what you said, it would actually go up, not down. So Logan and Nicholas agree, except for Nicholas has a negative in there. I'm sorry, Logan has a negative in there. My guess is that's the right answer then. Notice from the picture that if you will, S of X, because this is such a small angle, notice it's down 12 degrees. I didn't even draw the negative 12. I just put 12 there because I went the correct direction for negative. You should get a pretty big X. In other words, close to 142, but smaller. And because 12 degrees is a pretty skinny little angle, you should get a pretty small answer for Y. And it should be negative. So your S of Y. Everybody else throw their answer in chat too. I want to see them. I haven't done it yet, but a number of you are saying it's like 138.9 and negative 29. So I'm guessing that's probably right. So if you do it using logic slowly, I'm going to start into it. Please keep typing your answers in chat. I see about half of you in there right now. I'd like to see the rest of you. I could say the sine of 12 degrees is opposite S of Y divided by hypotenuse. So that means the Y coordinate would be 142 times the sine of 12. Bella agrees. The problem with logic is you get S of Y equals 29.5. And if you don't look at the picture, which maybe is what Nichols did wrong, if you don't look at the picture, then you don't realize, oh, that's actually negative. The cool thing about the formula that says S of Y equals 142 times the sine of whatever the angle is, like, like leave the negative in it, then you'll automatically get the negative for free. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you would never call the length of a side 
you would never call an angle negative 12 degrees in the picture. But if you just take 142 times the sine of negative 12, in other words, the y coordinate according to the formula sheet is r times the sine of whatever the angle is, like leave the negative 12, leave the negative on the 12, then you get the negative sign for free. So the advantage of using that formula is you don't have to think and it just pops out. But then I'm using a formula and I don't really, you know, I'm not sure I understand it. it looks like Stefan and Cole both agree too. That's awesome. Um, so I'm using a formula, but maybe I don't understand where it's coming from. I forget it six months from now and it's like I was never there. I kind of like Sokotoa, but then you got to think a little harder because you got to throw the negative in yourself. So S of X would be R times the cosine of theta. If I need to leave negative 12 in there, you guys all must be right. I didn't figure this out, but you all said it was 138.9 or round it however you want, but. So. Oh, excuse me. The negative would be important in this as far as the answer although if you drew the picture if you drew the triangle and then you and you had the you had s of y written as 29 then it'd be okay because you have the picture shows it so interesting question i have a gun and i shoot a bullet out of it and at the same time i'm holding a bullet next to it and right as i pull the trigger bam i let go of this bullet in this hand, right as I pull the trigger, which bullet hits the ground first, the one out of the gun or the one in my hand, assuming I'm shooting on flat ground. Do you know? The I think one I've in your heard, hand? I think I've heard this before. They both hit the ground at the same time. They're both being acted on by gravity at the same rate, except one also has uh, horizontal momentum. Yeah, Stefan says same time. That's actually true. It's a little hard to believe conceptually, but gravity pulls on it. It doesn't really make any difference what's happening to it horizontally. So they'll, I mean, the bullet's going to land like, you know, a mile away, but they're going to hit the ground at the same time because gravity's pulling on both of them. The reason I bring this up is this S of X right here in, in terms of physics, because that's why you're taking this class, because it applies to things. If you go on to take physics, this 138.9 right here, um, if we ignore wind resistance, which is ludicrous to do because there's a ton of wind resistance, but that would actually just keep flying, like at least in space, that would fly at roughly 139 miles per hour forever, and there'd be no change in it. But the negative 29 actually has gravity pulling on it, which means gravity is pulling it down even faster, like one second later that 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 downward speed is going to be going even faster. Maybe you know that gravity pulls on things at negative 32 feet per second per second. In other words, when one second goes by, gravity will have sped that speed up 32 feet per second faster. Now I was in miles per hour. One was in miles per hour and this was in feet per second. So the units are all screwed up. But it would, it's actually going to speed it up. Does that make sense? So the, so the downward speed of something is actually changing, which is why when you drop it, it starts out at zero, but then it goes faster and faster and faster. And so I won't finish this application, but you can actually figure out where the serve will hit and when it will hit and whether it will be in. And so if we had time to talk about this, and we may, and we may in a future class, but I don't want to overwhelm you with that. You can actually determine whether this serve hits the net or whether it goes over the net but lands inside the service line. It turns out there's like a there's like a service line that looks something like this. And when the server is serving, they actually have to serve it into one box or the other. And so the question is, you know, will that actually land inside that box? Will it land out here based on the angle they hit it? Will it smack into the net over there? Will it land way back here? And you can actually do the math on that to kind of figure out where it's going to go. Ultimately, the fact that the there's a difference between the X, how the X works, which stays the same speed the whole time, and how Y works, that's what in my note sheet was projectile motion. Um, so again, all I'm saying is this is another place where you must split this into its X, Y components because they're 
acted on differently. They're acted on by gravity differently. So this is a reason to split them apart. Let's see. Let's try. Let's try one more question. Let me give. Let me give you kind of a neat um, engineering problem here. So, let's say that you would like to put a sign on a building, and so you weld a couple of pipes together like this, and you attach them to the wall in some way. We won't worry about that right now. And then you're going to kind of hang this sign down here. I'm gonna kind of draw it out and say, you know, come get haircuts at my place or whatever. And this is an awesome sign. So it weighs whatever, 120 pounds or something like that. So obviously if you did that, that's, that's a fairly heavy weight. That's a fairly heavy sign. And so does it make sense that somebody has got to figure out, you know, how, how big of steel does this need to be? Now, if you don't want to figure it out, you can just go get big steel and, you know, hope for the best. But what engineers do is try to keep people from wasting their money. So I want you to think about this. This is kind of like a vector problem for a second. So what we would have to decide, and I'll add this in here, is a couple of couple of things. Let's call this, let's say this angle right here is 40 degrees. And let's say this angle down here, that looks like, I don't know, let's call it 68 degrees. Yeah, I can live with that. So let's call that 40 and that 68 degrees. And so, so an engineer's job, what I, what I teach in my statics class is the sum of the forces in the X direction have to be zero. And secondly, the sum of the forces in the y direction have to be zero because we're trying to get this sign not to move. Do you understand that? This is what engineers do. Fine, you want to hang a 120 pound sign, knock yourself out. I will do the math. You will do the math to figure out how to make that happen. Because I need I need the overall, I need it not to be moving. If this is sitting here and I push on it with three pounds of force, it starts moving. Like I, there's things I don't want to move. Statics is the study, study of things not moving. I want bridges not moving. I don't want to move them X. I don't want to move X direction and I want to move it in the Y direction. I need those forces to be zero. This is the math that we do. So let's, what I, what I teach in this class is let's use this to make this happen. So let's see, I'm guessing, let's make vectors out of these. In other words, I'm going to draw an arrowhead so that I think, and I'm kind of guessing, does that vector go that way? Would it pull that direction? It kind of feels like it, right? Because 120 wants to go down and I have to kind of pull back up to keep that from happening. How does it pull up if it's just a steel beam? It's attached to the wall. So, if, if you imagine that this was was attached to the wall over here, then it would be able to pull. So in the same way, like I'm sitting here right here and there's my hand and I'm holding it up. If I put this pen on that, does it make sense? My hand is pushing the pen up right now. Like my muscles, this pen doesn't weigh very much, but if my muscle had to like step it up a little bit, right? Cause I put something heavy on it. Does it make sense if I got enough stuff up there? Eventually, I would not have the force to resist it. It'd be like, ugh, and it would drop. Well, that's what's happening. And that's why we have to figure this out because it could pull away from the wall. So we got to put enough screws into the wall. We got to attach it to the wall in such a way it doesn't rip off the wall. And, and that doesn't mean like today, it means like six years from now. So, I'll guess, because I'm not really sure, I'm going to guess the other one's doing the same thing, like they're both pulling in that direction. But can anybody tell me why that can't possibly be true? How come those, those two arrows, how come, how can those two vectors not both do that? Remember, I need the sum of the forces in X and Y to be zero. 
The distance the weight is away from the wall. Say that again. The distance the weight is away from the wall. You can't pull it, it has to push it out. In other words, you have a like a sense of structural understanding so that you're saying if this was out from the wall and you put this weight on it, it's actually going to try to make that bottom one kind of smash and get smaller. You're right. Yes. Would you agree that this 120 has no effect in the X direction because it's going straight down? So it has no effect in the X direction. And both of these are going right. So does it make sense the whole thing's going to go right? That's not going to work. One of those has to go left and one of them has to go right. So I'm actually wrong. Like there's no way those both go that way. So then would the top one be going the opposite direction? One of the two of them would have to be. I would assume I the bottom the one would be pushing. The lower it. one would have to be pushing it out. Yeah. So Stefan was right about this based on. Now, you can actually leave it the way that I just described it, and we could just do the math, and we'll just get negative answers. But just for the, in the interest of time, since we're about out of it, I'll fix this one. This one's actually going to be pushing in that direction. Now, would you agree you have one right and then you have one left? And so if those were equal, if those were the exact same, then this wouldn't move left and right. Now, what's weird about this, though, is you would you agree the purple one is actually pushing down even worse? Like it's, it's already 120 going down. And because that lower vector is pushing down, it's actually worse. So let's see if we can use this concept that we've been learning today. Again, this is harder than your assignment. This has nothing to do with your assignment. It's just kind of a, a parting practical question to help you think about this. So I'm going to call this one force one, just so we have something to talk about. And this is force two. Would you agree those two angles are not the right angles for us? That's not what we, that's not how we measure the angles. What you need is from here, how far is it to there? Like what is force two's angle really? It's not 68, what would you call it? Since we call this zero. Would it be uh, 112? No, that's not right. It'd be negative, it would have to be negative 112. Negative 150, wait, I did this wrong, didn't I? Yeah, notice this angle's 90, right? Yeah, no, negative 158. 90 and 68 together would be 158, but that's negative, does that make sense? So this theta is actually negative 158, and you gotta figure that out yourself. Like people in the real world don't draw plans and tell you the angle's negative 158. They draw pictures like I just drew. And you have to be the one to say, okay, well, actually, you know, we would call that negative 158. And so that's force two. And so in a sense, force two is maybe it's 80 pounds or maybe it's 50 pounds or something. I don't know what it is. What would you call this one up here? Notice this one's a little worse, or is it? Notice the arrowhead. The arrowhead's on this side, and the angle I was given is like up here at 40. What we need is this angle right here. Does that make sense? Let's see if I can figure it out. We're going to run out of time, so I'll, I could draw that right triangle. Oh, 90. This would have to be 50 then. Do you agree with that? Because all the angles in a triangle have to add up to... 180, and then this angle is 90, so that means theta is 40 degrees. And so, oddly, that angle was the right one. I thought that angle wasn't 90, the bottom one. It's not between here. Oh, I see. Never mind. It's between horizontal, because the angle we're after is really this angle. Does that make sense? It's always from horizontal. Yeah. Good question. Good thought. So that one actually is 40 degrees. Well, now you have everything you need. So let's, let's look at this. So would you agree the sum of the forces in X? Let's see, what's the X component of force one? 
Well, it's force one, which we don't know, multiplied by the X coordinate. Isn't it that the cosine of 40 degrees? Isn't that what we said? That's R times the cosine that gives us the X coordinate. And then for force two, it has to be multiplied by the cosine of its angle, which is negative 158 degrees. And I need those to add up to zero. Notice the 120 doesn't contribute. There's three vectors here. There's three forces pulling on that joint. We're trying to get that joint to stay static, not move. I don't want that joint to move. If it moves, it's falling. I need that joint not to move. But 120 has nothing to do with that. What about down here for force, the sum of the forces in Y? Well, same thing, except for I have force one times the sine of 40 and force two times the sine of 158 negative. And then don't forget the 120. And notice it's down because it's negative, right? It's pulling down. I need that to be zero too. Notice this is kind of cool because it's two equations, two unknowns. Like you studied a lot of algebra before you got to this class. Can you solve those two equations, two unknowns? Like this is literally what it takes. Like there is not an easier way to do this. This is what engineers do. This is not as nice as your homework questions, but it's way more practical. I'm wondering if you see this as kind of like, you know, 3x plus 2y equals 0 and 4x minus 7y equals 3. From a, for, you've done this in previous classes. Like, can you solve that even though this is kind of weird looking? So that's not 3. It's just some weird decimal number. So that's not 2. It's some weird decimal number. Doesn't mean you can't do it. I'm going to quickly punch some of those things in. Let's see the cosine of 40. At least you want to leave you with the right answer. So, so I got about 0. 0.766 times force one. Cosine of 40 is 0. 0.766. Cosine of negative 158 is negative 0. 0.927. So 0. 0.927 times force two, that equals zero. Same thing with sine. Sine of 40 is 0.643, so 0.643 times force 1. Sine of negative 158 is predictably negative, negative 0.375, force 2. And then minus 120 equals 0. If I add that to the other side, I get 120. Do you still know how to do this? Remember, this is your last algebra class. My guess is this isn't easy, but you're never going to get taught this stuff again. My question is, were you taught it well enough or slash, did you put enough time into it yourself that you can apply that skill to this situation where it's not just boring threes and twos and fours and things like that? I'll show you a cool, quick way to do this because those are really weird decimals. If I take both of these equations, if I take this 0.643 and I multiply that, that equation times 0.643, and I take this 0.766 and I multiply this equation times 0.766, do you agree that the number in front of the F1 will be the same now? Except for, I'd like to add these together. So I'm going to make that one negative. Make this one negative. So 0.643 times 0.66. There's more than one way to do this, but I got 0.493. So that top equation becomes negative 0.493 force 1, negative 0.643 times 0.927. I see we're almost out of time. Is positive 0.596. And fortunately, when I multiply by zero, it's still zero. So that's my first equation. Second one is going to be the exact same answer, except positive 0.493 force one. And then 0 0.766, 0 0.766 times negative 0.375 is negative 0.287. And then I got to multiply it by 120. 120 times 0.766. 91.92. Does anybody understand why I did that? Do you still understand why did I do that? Why did I, 
it's okay to multiply equations times anything I want, right? Just make sure you do it to everything. Distributive law. Why did I do that? Because now I can add those two equations together. What's going to happen when I add negative 0.493F1 plus positive 0.493F1? It'll cancel out. Yeah, I get nothing. And when I take 0.596 minus 0.287, I get point positive 0.309F2. When I add those together, I get 91.92. Notice that's a way to take two equations, two unknowns, and reduce it to one equation, one unknown. Hey, look, now I got one equation, one unknown. I can just take 91.92 divide by 0 0.309. And I just found force two, 297.5 pounds of force. Whoa, that's like triple, double, it's double, double and a half, the 120, isn't that crazy? Force two. I'm still not sure why for the sum of Fy, you had to minus 120 at the end of that first equation. Because this, because I hung a 120 pound sign on it and that's pulling downwards. So that's negative 120 pounds. So that contributed to the Y, but it didn't contribute to the X because it's pulling straight down thanks to gravity. So I didn't have to convert that to its X, Y components, if you will. Okay, so if, it, if this problem was different and it had some it had some force that acted only on the x coordinate, like I don't know, wind. Yeah. Then you would That's subtract right. that from the sum of fx and do nothing with the sum of fy. That's exactly right. That's exactly okay. what I had to do. So I, I need to let you go. So I'll go back and so now that I know force two, does it make sense I could stick this equation back into any equation I wanted to, but but I'll take, I'll take it and put it back into this top one up here. And then you just solve for force one. Yeah, so I'm gonna stick it right here and I'm gonna say negative 0.927 times force two, which is 297.5 and I'll add it to the other side. So if I take that 90, just to write the right answer down, if I take 297.5 and I multiply it by 0.927, I add it to the other side and then I divide by 0.766, I get force one is incredibly 360 pounds. Those are the results. Now let's go back and stick those in the picture and then I gotta shut up. This stuff is so cool, I can't help myself, 360. So that means this has got 360 on it and that other one has actually got, I'll round it off to 298. This has got 298 on it. Isn't that crazy? Like it only hung, it only hung a 120 pound sign and yet notice, whoa, it's a good thing we did the math, right? Cause it's like what an engineer does is say, okay, well let's go look up in a table then different types of steel and let's make sure that steel isn't gonna buckle or rip in half with 360 pounds on it, I never would have thought that. Like the person that doesn't know engineering, doesn't know the math that you know, would just say, oh, 120. Well, let's go find a piece of steel that can hold 120. But remember the angles make a difference. The angles screw that all up. And so that put way more force, that put way more force on those, on those two pipes than you would have thought. So that's kind of cool. So 360 pushing right at 40 degrees and 298 pushing left at 68 degrees actually balanced each other out. So there's no force left or right now. So it's not gonna wanna move. If the bottom angle had been better, would those numbers be lower? Like if it had been like above 90, so that angle isn't like pressing down on it? That's exactly right. Cause you know, you as an engineer can adjust how, what angle those are at and maybe make, make the forces a little bit less and so forth. But yeah, the angles that you put stuff at make a big difference. And maybe this is a terrible design. Maybe we got lucky and it's a wonderful design. But like, I mean, this is a cool problem. I, I, I sort of apologize for showing it to you because like you don't need to do that for your assignment. But real life, real life is much harder than, you know, these kinds of questions. That's kind of the, the problem I have is like, you know, 
what's 4u minus 2v? Like, okay, fine, we can figure that out, but it's not very practical. And notice the problem I just gave you is kind of cool because we didn't actually know what the two forces were. We had to figure them out for ourselves, and you can't build that without figuring that out, which is why engineers make good money. And maybe some of you are going down that road. All right, I need to shut up. Stay after if you want to ask me more questions, but you guys are polite and haven't left, even though it's 10 minutes over. So you can always leave at 720. Uh, you. Thank you. you go. Sorry. Thank you. See you guys. All right. See you later, Logan, if you're there.